if I ask the generation behind me, all the 20 to 25 year olds, you know, what was Jack Dempsey's record? Who's Joe Lewis? Um, who was Bob Fitzsimmons? They, they have no idea who these guys were. Dying, these old school guys are dying. So I feel like the more I talk about them, you know, and, and if I mention them in articles and I mention them in interviews, it's almost like I'm summoning their energy back because I'm keeping them alive. I'm a champion, I can never stop. If you put me in the square, I square up like a box. Good people, bad intentions, the tail of the tape. See the passion in my eyes, the real ones can relate. I said, I'm a champion, I can never stop. If you put me in the square, I square up like a box. Good people, bad intentions, the tail of the tape. See the passion in my eyes, the real ones can relate. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to episode 39 of the Good People, Bad Intentions podcast. And today, as our guest, I have Ryan Riziki. Before I get into that, I just want to say to everybody, thank you so much for tuning in. I know it's been five months since I last put anything out on the podcast. And in those five months, I was focusing on school. Uh, if you didn't know, I'm in my first year of a two-year program called the Radio Television Journalism Program at the NSCC Ivany campus. And what I'm doing there is to try to become a journalist and do something like this full time. So uh, really appreciate everybody that's coming back. If you guys missed the podcast, tell me in the comments below. Uh, but today we have Ryan Rizicki. Uh He's currently ranked uh, number six uh, in the cruiserweight division. And he's going to be fighting uh, June 10th against Jean-Jacques Olivier. And they're going to be fighting for the WBC silver cruiserweight title. And the idea is that the winner likely will be fighting against Badu Jack for the uh, international title. And of course, Ryan, um, he had fought in 2021 against Oscar Rivas for the inaugural Bridgerweight title. Um, and then also uh, l the last year, so 2022, he also fought against Yamil uh, Peralta from Argentina. Um, and he had won that uh, by decision. Uh, it was a controversial decision, uh, and that was for the WBC International Cruiser title. And so that decision actually had got reversed. Um, so Ryan's been picking up fights ever since then, um, and he's been looking great. He's uh, won his last uh, two fights by KO. Um, and this, this June 10th fight, he's going up against a uh, European champion. And uh, Jean-Jacques, uh, as far as my assessment, very um, high volume, close range, uh, worker kind of fighter. And he's gone through a lot. He's, he's, from my understanding, he was shot in the past. I think it was in 2019, so roughly four years ago. He's had a life or death situation in his life. Uh, so I think uh, when he's going up against Ryan, I mean, they're both going to have a very strong... Uh, mentality and, and ability to go deep in, in the fight so it's hard to know what the fight's going to be like but i'm really looking forward to it and of course this card that three lines promotions is going to be having in, in halifax without further ado we got kate breton's own ryan Rizicki. hey ryan thank you so much for coming on the podcast i really appreciate you coming on yeah no no problem man i'm uh i'm glad to be on anybody who's uh involved in boxing from Nova Scotia, you know, I support. So anyone who's involved with boxing from anywhere, but especially the Maritimes, you know. Yeah. And the, I think one of the, the first times I saw you was uh, at the St. Valentine's Day Massacre card. I was uh, cornering a guy there, and I got to meet you. Of course, the, the fight was at Center 200, and this was like a month before uh, the pandemic had, had hit us all. And uh, it was a great time. You had the Highland dancers coming. You had this great entrance. Uh, can you just go back to that? What was that event like for you? Yeah, that was a big one. I, I remember that one. Um, you know, it was just, um, for me, like, fighting in Cape Breton is different. Like, that fight, even the last fight in Cape Breton, the fight I had against Peralta, Sean Miller, they were all just really exciting uh moments in my career pretty equal each each one yeah i had saw you um well not not saw you but when i was doing an interview with brandon brewer about a year or so ago 
uh, you were in the background. That was right after he opened up the, the coach lab and was doing his own gym in uh, New Brunswick. And I had made some, uh, some mention to you. I said, hello and everything like that. And, uh, I've seen you, I've seen you since around. Yeah. And, uh, just really want to congratulate you on, you know, your career and how it's been going so far. I know you had fought against Oscar Rivas for the, the inaugural Bridgerweight title. You know, you had the fight with Peralta for the Cruiserweight WBC title. And, uh, yeah, what what's it been like now finally um, getting to that point in your career where you're getting the, you know, the big fights and you're, you're – Every fight, you're you're in in title contention, basically. Yeah, it's like it. Uh, it came quicker than I expected, to be honest. But well, if I'm being completely honest, like you know, you could even talk to my coach about this because we had a conversation yesterday, and it's it's funny. So my my fight June 10th is for the um, the interim or silver, whatever you want to call it, WBC belt, which will put me mandatory position to fight Badu Jack. So like big things are are happening, and like. Honestly, you could you could ask Brandon the same thing when I turned professional because he Brandon turned me pro, right? I fought on his um, on his undercard in Fredericton. That was my pro debut, and I fought to make five hundred bucks. Then I like I remember I used to tell people like I'll probably retire with like a a losing record because I had a losing record in the amateurs. I had no aspirations of being like anywhere near top ten level. Like I didn't think I would be a top one hundred fighter to be honest with you, let alone like a world title contender. So, you know, the fact that I'm even here and I'm, I'm, I'm in there in the mix with the best in the world, it's still kind of, it still doesn't really set in. I just, I just kind of see fights as fights, you know, get in, get paid, make my money and have good fights. But it is, it is pretty exciting though, to be in the mix now. I had watched a, a 2017 interview you had done with CTV Atlantic and uh, you had mentioned in that interview about maybe some doubters that you had earlier on in your career and your amateur career. Uh, you don't have to like necessarily name anybody, but was was that kind of the source of maybe some of the doubt into your career early on and not really seeing it amount to much? Or where do you where did you get that from? You think I would say it's probably just the way that I I grew up, where I grew up. Like we didn't have there was no professional boxers in my area. There was none for. I think it was at least, I could be wrong, but we're talking like 30, 40 years before me, the last professional boxer in Cape Breton. Because Cape Breton is kind of a world of its own. Like it's the island off Nova Scotia. Like Cape Bretoners don't even really consider themselves part of Nova Scotia. They, they you know, they call them the mainlanders. They, they think they're their own world. So, you know, and I grew up in that area and that's, that was my mindset too. So just being surrounded by people, you know, when, when I said, you know, I'm going to be a professional fighter, this is what I want to do, they would just be like, oh, what are you doing? You're going to, you know, you're going to get hurt and this and that. And so there was never any any thought in my mind about how far I could actually go with it. It was just more of like, I just loved to fight and I wanted to just do it full time, you know. I'm from I'm from Yarmouth, the other end. I don't know which, which end has it tougher, but I know that like in both areas, um, you know, fishing and, and other, you know, physical uh, labor jobs are like a huge part of our economy and everything. Um, have you been throughout your whole career been able to connect with kind of your people and where you're from and and allow that to give you strength in the ring? Yeah, 100 percent. I, I, I always, you know, I've always walked out with the Cape Breton flag behind me or in front of me. Or, um, I've always, you know, represented them because the the type of people I've grown, I grew up around, like my family, the, my family friends, they've all like, they're the hardest workers you could imagine. Like, like, and I'm not knocking anybody here in Ontario. Everybody's doing their thing, but this is nothing. Like, these the, these people wouldn't last a fucking day in Cape Breton. I swear to God, like, it's just the way the way we grew up. Like, you're 11 years old. You gotta you gotta go haul hardwood in minus 30 weather. With no, like, oh, you forgot your gloves? Too bad. The trailer's still got to be loaded. Like. This is the way it was. You, you break your finger or something working or you get a cut. Well, you deal you deal with it when the job is done. You know, this is the way it was. So it's like and I and I was I was raised in that that kind of environment. So I I always like when I carry that flag, that's what I'm representing. And like you know, things change as generations go by, so 
Am I representing today's generation of Cape Bretoners? The ones who are like softer than Pop Tarts? No. I'm not representing them. I'm representing the old the old maritimers who grew up in that tough mindset, those tough people that worked for everything that they have. You know, those are the people those are who I'm representing when I hope when I raise that flag. I'm not I'm not representing my little haters who who are talking shit behind a computer. So it is what it is. One one thing I've always loved throughout your career is you make really great posts on social media. I know that that's not necessarily what you do as a professional, but I know that you understand the part of social media and how it plays into the fight game nowadays. And one thing I always appreciated watching was how you make these posts. You'd be working these night shifts, and then you'd be going to the gym or you'd be training and working. Can you kind of talk about what it was like when you were working these these long hour days and then going and training too yeah there was there was a time like honestly for the past couple of years it's just been i've been i've been lucky enough where i could get a couple sponsors and stuff so i could actually box full time but there was times like even in my pro career where i'd be working as a bouncer working a door so i'd be working from like but be, but besides that i would also be doing physical labor i'd be doing roofing i'd be cutting wood working in the woods, cutting pulp, cutting hardwood, um, doing just about anything I could do. So my, my, you know, like, let's say if I'm in the working roofing all day, I would do that. That would be my conditioning. And then I would go and I would work the door at a bar from, let's say, 10 p.m. till 2 o'clock in the morning. And then at, you know, 2 o'clock comes to 2.30 or so, I would leave there and I would go down to the north end of the boxing gym because I had a key for the boxing club. And I would go in and I would train till like five o'clock in the morning, you know, and then I would go home. I would sleep for like two hours. I'd get up and then I would go do roofing for the day. Like this is, and then I would fight like, and then I would go and I'd fight. Like I, I literally would do that for my first like seven or eight pro fights. That's how I, that's how I got by. And then, like I said, it wasn't until fairly recently that I was able to, just train full time, only only train, and and you're seeing the improvements in the ring as well. Like now that I'm actually able to box full time, you know. When you're doing those, when you're doing those jobs where you're you're kind of you know physical labor or you know I work kind of security, so and I understand kind of the the role of a bouncer. Are you visualizing your fights while you're doing these other tasks, or how much does the fight? take a part of your, your everyday life when you're, when you're thinking about <laughs> no so when i when i was like you know 20 my early 20s like i would literally so i'd be working a door and i'm i look around and if the, everything looks good and the you know there's nobody's acting up or anything i go in the bathroom like act as if i'm going in the bathroom and i'd be in the, the mirror shadow box and for like 20 minutes another bouncer would come in like what are you doing ryan I'm like man i got a fight coming up i gotta i gotta work on some things here or i remember i used to like i'd put my back up against the wall like, and this is what I do even when I worked, I used to work security and bouncing and all this stuff. No matter what I was doing, everything was boxing intention. So, like, I would be, have my back up against the wall. I would pivot off the wall, throw a left hook, like, all night, all shift. This is over and over. Or if I was, like, working in the woods, I remember, like, I would purposely, like, park the trailer 25, 30 yards from the tree. And I would pick up each log and I would throw it as if I was throwing a punch. That's the way I would throw the log, like. Everything was just training, training. Everything I did was was training for a fight. Wow, I can I can imagine the the situation, uh, you know, socially when he could have bounced. That's like no. what's going on there, <laughs> yeah. Ryan in the bathroom. But no, I I get what you're saying. Um, you got to find that time right for for you to practice, and and with that kind of schedule, I mean, it can be any time. But I'm I'm just wondering because. You know, I've, I've uh, seen stuff where you had talked about the days where you were training in, in I believe, a barn yeah. by yourself all day. Um, what was kind of the source of inspiration? I, I, like, I, I think a lot of people understand the story about how you had um, had some trouble growing up and you had the decision of you wanted to be a hockey player. But then your father, I think, wanted you to get into boxing. I think everybody knows that story by now. But I'm just curious, like, what really got you into that next level with boxing and, and started, starting to really obsess about it? Um, so, yeah, the yeah, that's that story with the, the whole the court thing. And then, 
like I said, yeah, it was one of my conditions was to join a sport. The the judge was like, he was, I think it was my third charge in like three months during when I was 15. I was just fighting like nonstop. And I mean, I fighting every single day I was in a fight. So I was obsessed with fighting before I was obsessed with boxing. It wasn't because I didn't really know what boxing was. Like, obviously I've heard of Mike Tyson and stuff, but I couldn't tell you like anything about anybody. And then, um, so once, once I actually went to a boxing gym for the first time, like my dad said, I want you to try this out, went to the boxing club and it like, it killed me. I remember I did the workout and it was just, I didn't spar and all that. I just did the heavy bags, the skip and everything. And like, I remember like throwing up as I'm leaving and like, I thought I was going to die and all this stuff. And I was like, I'm never doing that again. <laughs> no way. And then, uh, I, I went home and I looked, I went on YouTube. I think it was YouTube, but I don't even really remember. We had like a computer, like remember the big, the big screen. So I went in there and I just Googled boxing. I go on Google and I Google boxing because I just wanted to know a little bit more about it. And I'm like scrolling through videos and I find, I, I remember seeing, I very remember, I still have this memory of like Mike Tyson highlights and I'm like, nah, I keep going scrolling. It's like Mayweather, nah, Muhammad Ali, nah. And then I saw this black and white film, and it was Jack Dempsey versus Jess Willard. And I'm like, yeah, I want to click this one. Because it was like, it's just intriguing because it was black and white. It's like, well, that's pretty cool. So I clicked it. And I remember when the when the, the fight started, and, like, Jack Dempsey's, like, he's, like, assaulting Jess Willard in the ring. It's not even a boxing match. He's just straight up, like, it's a violent assault, you know? And I saw that, and I was just, like, mesmerized. I'll never forget it. And I was like, okay, I want to be that guy. Like, I want to I want to be that guy. And I could hear, like, the way that the commentators were, were, were saying, you know, down goes Willard and whatever. And, like, I was just obsessed with it from that moment. And, uh, yeah, it just spiraled from there. I just started watching them every day. Like, every time I got on the computer, Jack Dempsey. Like, I know everybody else at my age, 15 at that time, they were probably looking at some different stuff on the computer. Jack Dempsey. <laughs> Jack Dempsey versus Jess Willard. Jack Dempsey versus Gene Tunney, versus Furpo, versus all these guys. I was watching these fights over and over, you know? And I didn't even really get into, like, know much about his actual life until later. I was just obsessed with actually watching the fights. It's like I didn't really care about who he was or anything until, like, later. I was like, it was his style and what he did to the people in the ring. That that was what made me obsessed with, you know, this guy. I seen a, a really beautiful post that you made not too long ago regarding Jack Dempsey, uh, July 4th, 1919. And it was talking about, you know, how boxing was a gentleman's sport before that fight with Willard. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you, you make mention about how you, you thought Mike Tyson was kind of the last of the, the type or the animal, but that you're wanting to be uh, the next one. Yeah. Yeah. Do you do you think um like what do you, what do you what do you think makes these types of fighters do you think like have you have you tried to look at at kind of the the similarities between all these different types of fighters I did and and you know what it's it's the way that they come up it's it's where they come from it's like there's there's different like I think there's different traits that they have different like maybe mental things going on with each fighter but it definitely they're products of their environment. Like that's, that's what it, what we're, how they're created. Like you can't take a guy like Ryan Garcia. You can't take a guy like, and he, this is a hard man who, who can fight. And he's a, he's a violent dude is Javante Davis, for example. But Javante Davis was gifted into the limelight. Yes. He worked for it. Yes. He came from tough places, but he got blessed when he ran into Mayweather early in his career. Jack Dempsey didn't get blessed by nothing or nobody. Do you know what I mean? Sonny Liston didn't get blessed by nothing or nobody. These guys, like, they had no choice but to to fight their way into that limelight. Even Mike Tyson, like, he got a little blessed early in his career. And, again, I'm not – I mean, you if you know your boxing, you know this is – a lot of people don't want to hear this, but as, as much of a killer as Mike Tyson was, he wasn't like Jack Dempsey. He says he was like, there's interviews where he's like, I'm cut from the same cloth as Dempsey and, um, and Liston, but he's not, he says he is, but he's not because after four or five rounds, if the guy showed some durability, 
what happened to Tyson in those fights. Look at the fights with Jack Dempsey when he got smashed out of the ring by Furple. You know, he has his jaw broken in fights. What does he do? He he finds a way to still win these fights. But like Mike Tyson found out there was a bit of adversity, you know. He bite a guy's ear to find a way out. Like that's like these these guys were real killers back then. So Mike Tyson was the last one, but he was only a fraction of what they were. And he knows that. If I ever get a chance to talk to him, he's going to admit it. I know it because he knows that it's true. There, he'll ne- there'll never be another like Jack Dempsey. There'll never be another Liston. There'll never, never be another John L. Sullivan, these type of guys. Yeah, one thing I appreciated from uh, Dempsey, and, and you might be able to correct me because I, I think you honestly are – uh, you know, one of one of the the most well read and well watched of 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 Dempsey. But uh, if I'm not under, if I'm not mistaken, wasn't he like traveling from uh, city to city or from place to place on the train, like hitching, um, you know, like going underneath trains and everything like that to get to to get to fights? Yeah, he would tie he would tie his arms and legs underneath the train, like he would hook on, tie himself there so he wouldn't fall. And then when the train stopped, he would get himself off and he would go in and he used John L. Sullivan's famous line. He would go into like a local bar or whatever and he would ch- tell the bouncers, I'll, I'll beat any man. And he said, I'll, I'll lick any son of a bitch in the house. That's what he would say. But he, but Dempsey copied John L. Sullivan. So Dempsey's mother, um, when Dempsey was first born, he was just a baby, her, her his mother found a magazine or something or a write-up of John L. Sullivan. And she said, I want my son to be like him. So when Jack Dempsey was coming up and he was being raised, his hero was John L. Sullivan, just like Dempsey is to me. John L. Sullivan was to Dempsey, you know? So in a way, is it is it almost like, uh, you know, he was created by his by his mother as far as like that obsession and, and that was kind of instilled in him? Yeah, she wanted him to be the next John L. Sullivan. Okay. And he was, yeah. Now I've seen I've seen video, and, and I'm just curious for my own sake, but like I've seen video where you're you're kind of starting your day, you know, watching uh, Jack Dempsey before you before you uh, start, and and I'm just curious, like I've seen you s- say about wanting to fight him, and maybe maybe he would he would beat you or whatnot, but if you could actually talk with Jack Dempsey today, like what kind of conversation do you think you would have? I think we'd have to fight first and then we would talk after. Okay. Yeah. (laughs) I don't think there would be any talking. It would just be, it would be, it would have to be a fight because it would be something like you can't talk about with words. You would have to talk about it with our fists. We'd have to see who can, who can outlast who, who's actually got more in the tank, more heart, more power. We're going to find out and then we're going to talk about it after you know but if i could but if i could sit down and talk to him i don't know i don't think i would talk too much no no i would just listen okay yeah have you been to his uh i think he's got like a bar right he had a restaurant a restaurant it was in the rocky balboa movie rocky balboa actually he's wearing the dempsey shirt in that movie and he's it's he's outside that's the restaurant is based off of dempsey yeah okay yeah no i've never been but um so I plan on before I get another world title shot, I, and I've already spoken to my promoters, I won't get in the ring for a world title until I visit his grave. Okay. It's an interesting condition to have. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hopefully. Are you going to be respectful at the grave, I hope? Oh, yeah, yeah. No, I'll okay. be, it, it'd probably be a moment. Like, it'd be something Something weird's going to happen. I don't know. <laughs> it's like, like yeah. I, I know, like, something... <laughs> Some spiritual shit's gonna happen when I get there, cause, like, the more that I, the more that I bring up these old school fighters, like, you can even watch my fights. Like, for example, my last fight, I was in a mindset where I felt like physically I wasn't right. I wasn't right physically. I had a bad camp, and I needed to find another way. I needed to find another way to beat this man before, cause I just knew like I was physically going to be at a disadvantage. So I started watching so much Sonny Liston and I started watching the way he looked at guys the way like the way just he was when he was with a guy like he was going to fight the weigh-ins and everything else I just I studied what he what he would do to intimidate them because intimidation is huge in boxing right and I, I kept mentioning 
um, Sonny Liston. And then it's almost like an energy thing. Like when, when the weigh-ins came and I looked at this guy, Gorloff, like I'm like, I'm just going to look at him with, with the same stare that Sonny Liston stared at Floyd Patterson and he broke him. Like he, Floyd Patterson was a hell of a fighter, but Liston smashed him in the first round, I think it was, because he just had him mentally beaten before the fight even started. So Mike Tyson copied Liston with that, right? And, um, yeah, like, I, I knew I, I broke this guy before the fight even started just by the way I was looking at him. And I knew, like, I had Sonny Liston's energy was there, you know? So there's something, like, spiritual going on with, with these old-school fighters. And, like, I believe nobody today, like, for example, when Floyd fights or when was well, retired now, but when he was fighting, like, he's the biggest, all eyes are on him. The whole world's on him. Or, like, when Tank and Garcia just fought, the whole world is watching them, right? Like, they're not meant, nobody's talking about the former champions. No one's respecting what they did um, and, and keeping their energy going, keeping it alive. Like, and as, as the generations go by and, you know, we're all on this technology and everything else, like, we're, people are forgetting. Like, you, if I ask the generation behind me, all the 20 to 25-year-olds, you know, what was Jack Dempsey's record? Who was Joe Lewis? Um, who was Bob Fitzsimmons? Like, they have no idea who these guys were, you know? So it's, it's like, it's dying. These old school guys are dying. So I feel like the more I talk about them, you know, and, and if I mention them in articles and I mention them in interviews, it's almost like I'm summoning their energy back because I'm keeping them alive. And, and speaking about boat energy, and this is something that I would, I would be interested to have more discussion about is, is talking about the bruiser, the bruiser energy. Yeah. Now, I, I've heard that, that that kind of started when you fought against uh, Katag Pilev, the Dagestani. Well, it started long before boxing. That was something that okay. was, that was um, that's that thing that I have that just like a lot of these other fighters have. It's, it's a, you know, you got your first gear, your second gear, your third gear. You got your conditioning you can fall back on, your skill you can fall back on. But I have something that goes beyond that. It's like... Um, it's it's almost like a like a calm, composed rage that never dies out. Like you you know when 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 fighters get mad in the ring or they they get emotional, they fatigue quicker. Like it's everybody knows, and if you know anything about boxing, you know you don't you don't go in the ring with emotions because that's the recipe for disaster. You, if you start getting emotional in front of a fighter, he's going to capitalize on your mistakes. But every you know every so often you will you will run across a fighter who emotions actually fuel them like it's it's almost like an extra gear it's like you're literally it's it's a it's crazy so you know it's like i got this rage that i developed through you know my life through street fights through like you know troubles with the law like i said like all kinds of this crazy crazy violence so i hold in a lot of this rage and when i let it out in the ring like it's 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 just a different gear and, and it's like that's what so the bruiser that's what you that's what i refer to that as it's just like an alter it's like an alter ego but i'm i'm kind of in control of the alter ego kind of thing so um i'm always i'm always curious because i know you're popular and whatnot have you ever talked with like any sports psychologists or anybody that's in the game regarding your mentality and maybe had any thoughts have they had any thoughts about about this state that you go into when you're fighting or no if i if i talk to somebody like that they'd probably lock me up no okay no because <laughs> no it's it, it it's something like it's very very hard to describe with words like you you would yeah. almost be better off asking my coach about it because he yeah. he has a more better understanding like for example the the plea fight was the first time he saw it in the ring. It's not the first time it's come out in the ring. I, I've had amateur fights where it happened too, but that was the first time like I was under the lights as a pro where people got to see it. And he had never seen it like through sparring. Cause when I spar, it's just, it's just training to me. I'm not getting like that. But in that fight, it's like when I get put in a situation where, you know, there's, there's no other way out. Like this guy had my eye socket broke. The doctor was going to stop the fight. The doctor, I had two minutes before the doctor was going to stop that fight. And it was just boom. It, it happened. Like, it, and I sound like I tried to like force it out. It just happens on its own. And I don't remember that fight. Like I, like as soon as it happens and it comes on, I'm out. Like, I don't know. I don't even know what's going on. Maybe I was buzzed from his power. I'm not sure. But when I started coming back around, 
like Stevie had his, you can see in the video that fight, Stevie had his two hands on my, he already jumped in the ring because he knew something was going on. And he, he'll tell you, like, when he looked in my eyes, there, I was gone. I was not me. Like, he, he says, like, it took him, it took him to, like, he's like, just breeze, breeze. And I'm like, you know, I was somebody else at that point. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I've seen I've seen the stare downs um, in person. I saw the one at uh, St. Valent's, Valentine's Day uh, massacre, and they're very intense. And I I guess I guess you'd be like the the main deterrent or determiner of whether or not one is the bruiser or one's not. So is it kind of more of like a a rare instance? It only happens in certain fights, or do you feel like it's it's every fight at cer certain extent? Yeah, like it's um. It's it's almost like it's there when it need, when I need it, you know. But I but I am very calm. Like those stare downs, like that's I'm all there. I'm I'm okay. I'm aware of what's happening in the fights. I'm aware of what's happening. It's just like when when my back is put up against the wall, that's when boom. Like like in the Revis fight, like when I got cracked, I almost got knocked out in that first round. Like the round was over, but something brings me right back. Like it's like because I was like as I'm walking to the corner, I'm back and I'm mad. Like you know, but. It's weird. It's just it's something that's. I, I mean, I try to explain it best I can, but like I said, like my coach could tell you when when he got got in the ring after that, Clea fight, he he says he's like I don't know I don't know how to explain it. He can't he he he, he tries to explain it, but he's like it wasn't you. Your eyes were gone. <laughs> One thing I appreciate um, from from everything I've I've gathered is you really you really. You really understand where your opponents are coming from. Cause I know with that particular fight, I knew that you, there was, there was some interviews talking about an early on that you had some doubt where it was like, you know, I don't know, this guy must've gone through a lot. He's from Dagestan. It's a very, you know, tough, tough area. And, and so do you, do you try and when you go, go to fights, you're trying to understand your opponent's mentality and where they're coming from and where their strength is from and, and that sort of thing yeah I, I do a little bit like for yeah, that fight it was that's how it was and then like for example this fight coming up i know that this guy has been shot in the chest and had like a, a close encounter with death so i'm expecting a man to come who's not who, not that he's not afraid but he knows the he knows what it's like to be in a, a life or death situation. So like me, I'm, I'm training right now to put him there. I'm, I'm training to bring him back to the, to them places. Like, you know, that's my mentality going into this fight is I'm going to make him, make him not only think, but let him know like, this is where you're going to go tonight, you know? And then as the fight goes on, you know, that that's, that's where it's going to go. But, I now that I but that I know that he's been there and I know that you know that I'll take that and use it. I I watched some tape of your opponent, and my assessment is that you know he's a very very close and close uh, fights close. Yeah. Um, he's a worker, uh, volume puncher. Um, what's but what's your assessment so far as far as you know what he, what he can bring to the ring? I think you said he's he's uh. He seems to be more of an inside fighter. Um, he does throw a lot of punches. I think he throws a lot of hard punches. He's got a serious output of, of really good conditioning. And by the look of it, he's really durable too. So, like, I'm expecting a real, real tough fight. Like, you know, it's, it's a fight. at the end of the day, it's a fight. Like, anything can happen. I could have a terrible night. He could have a great night. I could have a great night. He could have a terrible night. We both could have terrible nights. You know, or we both could have a great night, and then you have a great fight. Yeah, I'm really looking forward to the fight, and and I'm glad that you touched on kind of because I looked into your opponent and I had seen that he had the whole story, and and that's kind of where he's coming from when when he's doing interviews right now is talking about that, and you know, and and I I I think um, did you did you know he's a rapper as well? Like like what do you like rapping what? I think he does rap, like music rap. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I thought. Yeah, I thought you meant like rapping, like wrapping up boxes. No. no. No, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw something. He's from a uh, French island called uh, Martinique, and it looks like he's he's done some rapping as well. It's like rapping. so he's a creative guy, you know. He's. 
so that's that's interesting that your assessment is uh is that way because yeah like I, I brought that up I was going to bring that up that that he went through that experience and that you know he's probably not scared to to go whatever depth it will be and there's yeah, but see there's two ways that can go like you have a close call with death like that you can either be so intrigued that you want to have a close call again like <laughs> it can go one way or that or you can be absolutely so grateful for life that you made it out alive that you want never ever to experience anything like that again so when i'm when i'm in front of him and i'm not going anywhere and the fight's getting tough and it's getting dark and i'm and I'm hitting him with every shot I hit him with is going to feel like I broke his bones. Like I know how hard I punch. I hit him in the body. He's going to feel like his, his organs are getting pierced with bullets again, you know, and we'll see where his mind, we'll see how bad he really wants it. Like I'll say that much. Of course he can knock me out with one punch. Anything can happen. But like, you know, he, he, he experienced what it's like to come close to death and like without without trying to sound too arrogant i can i can guarantee that he's probably going to experience something similar to that again when we fight you know and it's maybe i'll experience the same thing i just know where i take these guys like like revis for example he won the fight 12 rounds he never fought again and there's a reason why he never fought again because of the places that we went like they were familiar places for me and i liked those places because I've been there before outside of the ring. So I know what it's like to go there when you're you're knocking on death's door. But he he I don't think he was ever there before and when he got to there, he didn't like it. And he's never going to box again because he doesn't ever wants to experience anything like that again. That's why he retired. They can say it was an eye injury from the fight. They can say this and that, but I I seen the look in that man's eyes after the 12th round was over and it looked and it was the same look that you see in somebody's eyes if a bus just missed them. You know what I mean? It's it's like, wow, I made it. I made it. And then he never fought again. So he gave up a belt. He gave up a world title belt after that. You know, and like, Revis will forever be one of my favorite fighters. I'll always have so much respect for him. But like, the truth is that I broke him that night. You know? Was that your Rocky moment? I think so. I, I think it was. I think it was the first Rocky moment. But there's yeah. got to be a two. There's got to be a three. There's got to be a four. Yeah. You know, I'm looking at the the big picture. That was just the introduction to, to this film. Yeah, I wanted to have a discussion about films. Um, are you a fan of like not even just b boxing films, but just like films in general? Yeah, I do. I do. I have quite. I like films. I do. Okay. Um, somebody that that doesn't go away that i've seen you rocking lately mike myers halloween yeah um that's i just i just think it's very fitting with everything and etc but kind of what made you what what made you or like are you always a fan of halloween and michael myers yeah I, I, the first one i watched was the uh the rob zombie one the second one yeah halloween two i think it was like i can't remember the exact year that they he made that one but that was the, the first, first one, one came out in 2007 i think with rob zombie and then i i can't remember what this the second one came out second one so yeah the, that was the first one i saw like and i remember the scene when uh he's actually the the one the one that i loved he, so <laughs> he's at a strip club yep and he kills a couple of people in there and then he comes outside or no he comes outside maybe first and there's a guy out there who's like i don't know if he's a bouncer or what but he thinks he's a tough guy and he's like melting off to Michael Myers and he's just staring at him. He doesn't have a mask on. He's got his hood up and he's just staring at him. And the, and the guy's telling him, you know, you better go, blah, blah, blah. And the guy punches Myers in the face and it's just like, bing. And he's like this. And then he choke slams him, stomps his head flat. And I saw that and it was just like, damn, like, I don't know. I like this guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because... Yeah, it, it seemed like fitting because he's a guy that doesn't go away. And, and, and that's something I can say with, with all your fights is you don't, you don't go away. No, I'm not so, there. Like, you got to literally like, I have something I can't explain where you, they have to shut my lights off to, to stop me from coming. It doesn't matter what kind of pain I go through. Like I've been hit with those left hooks to the body and you can watch that Revis fight. And that guy's got 40 pounds on me. The punches he was hitting me with into the body, like, I was hospitalized after that fight with, um, I had kidney failure 
Like I had severe dehydration. My brain was swollen. Like I was literally on my um, next to death after that fight. But I would have gone ten more rounds. You, I would have kept going until my body actually like died. You know. So like you, you got to act. They have to actually kill me to stop me or knock me out. One of the two. Do you think that moment like? Do you think there will be a moment where where there there is that knockout on the record? Or do you think you're gonna? It's just always. It just if anything, it would be a a, a loss. No, no, I'll definitely I'll get knocked out eventually. Like, I am I, I've been knocked out on my feet. I've been rocked with shots, so I know like I I do have a crazy chin. Like I know like my ability to absorb shots is is ridiculous. But that being said, I'm a human, and we all have a button, you know. And and anybody can be knocked out. Jack Dempsey was knocked out in the first round against Fireman Jim Flynn early in his career. If you look it up, um, Joe Lewis been knocked out like. John L. Sullivan been knocked out. You know, all these all these greats, even the most violent killers of boxing, they were all knocked out at some point, one time or another. So, like, I'm sure I'll get mine, too. Sonny Liston was knocked out a bunch of times. Like, it's... it's I don't care about getting... If I ever get knocked out, it's like, to me, that there, now I just got my chance to prove that I can come back after it. You know, mm-hmm. I'll be looking forward to, to how I... How I come back after a knockout? I think if, if I'm understanding anything about everything that I know so far about you, coming back is like a huge part of like who you are, right? Because you know you've had some things when you when you were earlier on that you had to deal with, and then boxing was kind of like your comeback, right? Yeah. To that, and then even with your amateur career not going maybe the way that you had wanted, when you had your pro career, I mean it was like night and day right with 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 everything so like is that um is is that like a huge uh like does that does that come from anywhere is like just that wanting to to prove people wrong and and come back and from anything i think it's more prove to myself than than to prove to people of course it, like i'm in the limelight a little bit with boxing so proving things to people is always going to be a part of it because the people are you know it's important to people like yourself, we do the podcast, the people buy tickets to the fights, you know, all these people in boxing. So there's always going to be something to prove to, to people. But I, that's not my first thought that comes to mind. Like my thing is like, if it's just my character, if, if I have a bad night, I want to make it better. If I, if I, if I get knocked down, I want to get up. Like I just, I, I look more forward to, you're right. I look more forward to the, seems to be like the comeback. I give my, I give my absolute best every time and when it's not enough i almost get pissed off and i'm like okay you mother or like now i gotta now you gotta prove to yourself that you can come out of it you know so yeah it's more like a just ego proving it to myself that i can do it but yeah i think i think it's just a character trait that that was developed through experiences in life especially my younger life um i wanted to take things on a shift for for a moment something a little bit lighthearted um i know this isn't gq but uh you know you got a lot of tattoos and i know like a lot of people one of the first things they notice about you in the ring probably is all the tattoos that you got and i i know that i think you've gone to like 24 different artists something like that Uh, for sure yeah 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 um was what was your last tattoo that you had my last one was actually I just got one here by it's uh it's a tombstone. Okay. And it says the past on it. Like the past is dead. So I'm kinda in a mindset right now where not that I'll ever forget about some things, but I kinda wanted this one just as a reminder, like things I've done in the past don't matter anymore. Like I've done like I'm I get that I'm a I'm a role model to some some kids and stuff because I actually use boxing to to steer me in a better direction in life. But there is things I've done like I've you know I've beat like I've beaten people in street fights like like terrible beatings, terrible terrible beatings, terrible things I've done that I got to live with. But you know it's it's gone. It's in the past. That's it. It's dead. It's gone. It don't exist anymore. The only time it exists is if I bring it up like this in a conversation. So, you know, other than that, it's just 
these things are history. And and Cape Breton, it's a very small town, just as much as Yarmouth is. When these things happen, and and I know that there had been some charges previously, um, I know that it's different than if somebody's in Toronto or somebody's in New York. Like nobody knows everybody, but everybody's talking and things. Like, can you kind of talk about the the whole? factor of because there is some people that 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 hate on you for for things that have happened in the past do you got anything to say to those kind of people you know like they're to me they're they're hating on somebody that doesn't exist anymore i get it i get it i've done the things i've you know i've done these things to people but like uh, well number one i wasn't a bully i never started a fight any of the any of the things that that had happened they came to me was i obsessed with fighting yes could I have probably turned away and walked away? Sometimes I could have, but there was also times that I turned and tried to walk away and I got hit in the back of the head with a, with a bottle. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, so a lot of the, the people who hate on me, they don't know. They don't know the situations. They don't know. Like I'm in boxing now because like I've said it before in post, I'm, I'm doing something that I love to do and I'm not getting in trouble for it. I'm not getting looked upon as a, as a menace to society for it, you know, like I can do this and, and it actually inspires like young kids. Cause I know that, especially in the Maritimes and Cape Breton, Halifax and, you know, New Brunswick, there's a lot of young guys who are walking the same shoes I walked in the, and they're, they're going to end up in jail. They're going to end up killing somebody or getting killed because tough guys usually do get killed. The tough guys usually get shot or they get stabbed because People eventually don't want to fight them anymore. They're like, let's just off this guy, you know? So, you know, like the, so the people who hate on me and stuff, I can see why they do. But at the same time, like, if not now, later, I can guarantee that they're going to respect me because of the change, the change that I made, you know? And your father now, can you talk a little bit about how that's either kept where you're, what you've been doing as far as boxing and everything, or, or maybe has changed your mentality or definitely more motivation. Like when I, when I think about my daughter, like I think about she's someday she's going to see all these fights she's going to see. And like, I just want to set an example, you know, when she's older, like how, how hard work, work can get you. Like if anything, just, you know, just working hard and, trying to find the positive no matter what. Maybe someday she might be a, a violent little bugger, you know, and, and maybe she'll find boxing or it could be hockey, it could be rugby, it could be something, it could be painting, it could be anything, right? Like, whatever. But, like, she's got to go all in and, and forget about this other side because I know a lot of people have it, right? Other people, they they might take medications for it. They might um, go talk to somebody, whatever. Everybody's got an outlet that they, you know, but like extreme people, like that's the thing about me is like, I'm, I'm a bit extreme with the tattoos. I go, absolutely. I don't just get one, you know, I go absolute whatever. Like everything I do is, is I'm all in. So when I, when I started like getting introduced to violence in my life and like, you know, freaking fighting and just all this, this kind of life, I went all in. That's what happened. And I went all in with it. And it led me into the into the troubles with the law and the, the bad reputation and the like I was headlines for for bad things before I was headlines for good things you know and then I was headlines for bad things again and then good things again but like it's because I'm all in but right now like I'm in a place where I'm just I'm all in with boxing and it's been like this for the last three years and I just can't see it changing you know there's like somebody could come up to the side of this window right now and I'm just get lost he can do whatever. I'm, I'm, I got a fight coming up, you know, like that's where my mind is right now. So it, it's a positive thing in my opinion. So anybody who, like I said, who just hates on me and they want to, they want to talk and act like I'm still some menace to society. Like they're just losers. They're just losers. And they just can't like, they can't believe that somebody can actually change and somebody can actually do something good with something that looks so terrible, you know? What's been some of your keys to change? Who are some people? I know you look up to Jack Dempsey, but like, who are some people in your life or or that you you know of that that have been helping you through? I had a lot. I had a lot of of um, 
people that I respected that told me, like, from young, like, and it didn't really click in until later in life, if I'm 100% honest, like, for example, I remember, um, I'm like 15, 16 years old is when I'm first, like, I first learned that how hard I could hit, and when I learned how hard I could hit, like, it was game on in street fights, you know, like, that's when I stopped trying to avoid situations, instead, I would, if they came my way, I'm not letting it go now, not that I'd go look for it, but if it came my way, I'm, I'm okay, now it's, you know, it is what it is, so, I ended up hurting this guy really bad in a street fight. Um, I like blinded him in one eye with a punch and fra- broke his whole side of his skull. And it, it was a terrible thing, terrible thing, terrible situation. And I thought I was proud of it at the time because I'm a kid and I'm like, oh, look what I, you know, bragging to your buddies. Your buddies are bragging to their buddies. Riziki's this, Riziki's that. And I thought it was the best thing ever. And I'll never forget, I'm sitting at home and, and I, so I got a couple uncles um, who were street fighters and one particularly who was like he, he like he was to this day he was still whoop my ass to be honest with you. he's tough as they come and I thought he was going to be proud of me and he pulls in the driveway and I'm thinking oh he's going to shake my hand and say you know you're this but he came he almost knocked me out like he was like what are you doing doing this he's like you you can you're in boxing you can actually do something don't be like me kind of thing right that was but that I was kind of mad at the time I'm just a kid and I didn't really understand what he meant but now looking at it now today, it's like, whoa, that was one of those big moments for sure where, you know, that he, he really put something in my head. Like, this is not something to be proud of, like going out there and doing this shit. Like you see your, these guys, like, like even I've seen it where somebody will stab somebody and then they're, they're running away, high five their buddies. It's like, what the fuck you loser, you know? But, um, yeah, it's just like, it's really clicking in now to be honest, like at this age in my life for sure that's just one example but there's there's a few other so do you feel like you're in a unique position because although you've changed you can somehow understand maybe at risk youth and maybe you have a role in the future where you can you know you can help people out that have been in the same shoes you've been in yeah definitely because number one i'm still in those shoes i'm like that's the honest truth is i'm still doing like I'm still being me, like I'm still being that, that person, but I'm just doing it in a way that's, it's the right way. If there's a right way, it's boxing. If there's a right, it's MMA, it's jujitsu, it's wrestling. Like you, like just because you're a violent person it, to me, and it might sound crazy to some people, it was too bad. Just because you're a violent person doesn't mean you're a bad person. You know, that's the thing. A bad person is somebody who goes out, messes with kids, somebody who goes out, you know, like met like really weirdos to me. That's a bad person. Like lock them up and burn them, do something with them, you know, but violent people who love to fight, they just love to fight. Sure. I love to get hit. I love to hit people. And I like to be in the war and I like to shake hands after, you know, that's who I am. And like, you know, it's just like, there's a right way to do it and a wrong way to do it. And maybe I can just show people that this is how you do it the right way. You go into the professional sports. I think every th- I think I think you are on brand for what good people bad intentions has always a bit been about, which is you know even looking as far as back as Jack Dempsey and you know what he said in his fights and what he had done and everything. But you know at the end of the day, fighters who who love to fight and who love it for the sport or competitiveness or to see you know use it as a vehicle to improve themselves everything like that. At the end of the day they shake each other's hand and you know, it's all the fight is beyond what normal people have as a fight. Like some people have a fight in, in, in a non boxing context or a non MMA context. And it's like, they'll never talk to that guy for 20 years. Yeah. And then in boxing, it's like the, the same night you, you shake his hand and meet their family. Yeah, exactly. Like the, there's a few fights, my last fight, a couple other fights were, I was concerned that I like, cause I, I do like the truth is when I'm, when I'm in the fight, when I'm leading up to the fight, my intentions are not good to what I want to do to this guy. To me, like I put myself in a place where, you know, he's trying to take everything from me. So I'm going to take everything from him. That might be his life. That might be his health. That might be his career because he might take it all from me. And as evil as it sounds, it's true. You know, 
and like that's where I'm at going into the fight. That's where I'm at during the fight. Like when I hit when I hit a guy and I hurt him and I go in for that finish, like as calm as I am, my mind is in the most chaotic, violent place that you could imagine. As I'm trying to to knock him out, I'm trying to to put him out out, you know, and um, as soon as the fight's over, you can look. Like, without even, like, thinking about it, it's, I stop, and I hit, I pull back. Like, there's, like, my last fight, twice I did I hit him with a hook, and I stopped. I, I was hitting him with right hands, and as soon as he went down, I pulled the last punch. I did it against Katag, too, when he was going down. I, I pulled a shot, because, like, as violent as it is in that moment, and I'm trying to literally kill this man, as soon as I know the fight is over, my concern is for him. I'm like, okay, is he okay? Is he okay? Like, it goes from one extreme to the complete opposite it's that it's like i'm telling you like it's come it's madness but this is how it is and my first concern is always the opponent when it's over like i'm actually worried about them you know like i'm like are you okay and i like some of them don't speak english but you've like resna i remember i was helping him back and i was i kept asking him, i was like do you have a headache are you sick to your stomach and he like he didn't know what i was saying but i'm like worried that he might have a concussion which he probably did like but you know, and I'm like telling their corner, I'm like, get them electrolytes, like get, get them checked, you know, like make sure he's okay. And that's just like, that's just the way it is. I mean, I think that's, that's terrific that, that you can have that kind of understanding because I feel like people just don't understand that about me, maybe don't understand that about you or like on the surface level, because when they see like fighters like Jack Dempsey, like Sonny Liston, like Mike Tyson, yeah, I mean, with Mike, the thing that I've loved about his career even now, like just doing public uh, speaking and, and everything like that, is just showing a little bit of a, an insight into what it was really like when you're on top of the world back then in 86. And, you know, the fact that he was scared. And, you know, the fact that Teddy Atlas thinks that he, you know, Teddy Atlas goes out and speaks and says that Mike Tyson's still that kid that hides in between walls back in the day and like I, I i just i just love when when fighters are open about everything because i think it makes the sport more interesting to know you know where somebody comes from what their mentality is what they bring to the table because the stakes get way higher too because once you start getting behind a fighter and understanding, you know, where they're coming from, you start to support them a lot more and, and, and what they're doing. And I think a lot of people like I've, I've had a lot of interviews on this podcast where you were brought up, you know, I had uh, Aubrey McLeod was actually my first guest and I had Stevie Bailey, Brandon Brewer, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, to be fair in Canada for boxing, like I think Ryan Riziki is the biggest name right now. Uh, it could be. I I don't I don't look at it like that though. I like see to me, Brand. I still put even like Brandon for example, like br when Brandon introduced me to the pros. Like, true. Like to me, Brandon is here. You know, like he he's like I'm still like watching him and I'm like trying to do the things that he's doing because he's a phenomenal fighter. Like let's be real. You know, you know he like and the the heart the guy has the freaking everything. Everything about him, like to me, he's he'll always be here. Even if I become world champion in five years, and he becomes a freaking op opponent for a guy, you know, to me, he's still here. Like it doesn't matter where 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 we're both at in our careers. Like I don't I don't I I don't I don't see it that way. To be honest with you, like, but in like David Lemieux is another guy, you know, I, I put him up there and like that. But that's just the the, the way I am. Like I've been humbled in life like and in the ring like i've been humbled like i've i've taken some freaking some lickings for sure you know peralta he handed it to me that night it was that was a good humbling moment for me um there's there's been other fights amateur fights where i didn't stand a chance i got blasted out a couple times um like street fights i i went against a few guys at one time thinking i was going to be superman and i just next you know i'm on the ground getting my head stomped and i'm like oh shit like Okay, I'm not as tough as I thought I was here, you know? <laughs> it is what it is. So, yeah. What do you Okay, speaking of amateur fights, and I've always wondered this. Simon Keen, have you kept up with his career and and what do you think about a rematch? Like would that would He's a big guy. I can't believe yeah. you fought him back in the amateurs. I'd fight him right now. 
You would? He come up to this window, knocked on it with a pair of boxing gloves. And uh, no boxing gloves. I know I just said if a guy come up to the window, but if it was Simon Keen, that's a different story now. Because I like him. Like, if we hugged, hey, yeah, we'd yeah. probably hug it out, you know? But, yeah, I'd love to get that back because I know. Let's get the he, mullet going on, eh? Yeah. Get the, <laughs> he's the a crazy. Bull. He's crazy. He's a, he's a funny, actually a funny, funny guy. If you met him in, in person. But, yeah, he, he got me when I was training myself. I was training myself in a little baby barn. Like, I knew nothing about nothing. I was eating junk food, and I didn't do road work. And I had no idea, under understanding about, like, how to train properly. Like, I didn't have a full-time coach. And I just went there as, like, 195-pound super heavyweight. I had no business in the ring with him at the time. Even though he's a lot bigger now, I feel like if we fought now, I mean, anything can happen. He's a big guy with a little glove you never know. But I just I feel like it would be a different kind of fight right now. <laughs> you're you're so throwback because I feel like a th real throwback fighter there isn't any weight divisions. And... No, there's no they do. these guys today are are to me like I'm like I can't even have the conversation about the weight cuts and stuff. Like I'm like, what are you doing? Why like why? If if Ma if Max Max Bear could do what he did against Primo Carnera. Joe Lewis, Primo Carnera, Joe Lewis, Buddy Bear. Like, if you look at the size difference between these guys, like, why are these guys worried about trying to get 30 pounds off to fight a guy smaller than them? Or, like, and then they're depleting themselves. Or, like, cruiserweights, like, I don't know. They're, they're afraid to fight heavyweights. Like, that, that'll that never, never be me. Like, I'd, I'd rather fight Anthony Joshua than fight Joe Smith Jr., to be, to be honest with you. He's bigger and he's... He's slower, and if he hits me with one punch, I'm gonna be. I'm just gonna wake up rather than taking a beating for twelve rounds. Are you gonna be fighting this this upcoming fight at cruiserweight or heavy? No, this one's cruiserweight. So this this fight okay. is for the um, the uh, the interim title or the W or the silver, whatever they call it. Okay, it's for so the winner will become mandatory to fight Badu Jack. Does does uh, Jean Jacques does he have right now still the European Union cruiser as well as the French Federation? Uh, do you know if he still has those titles? I I don't know honestly. I don't know much about him. I do know about the European title, but like, yeah, I'm not. That's the thing. I don't really follow much about the the titles and stuff. Like, I just know where I'm where I'm ranked in the WBC because I want that belt particularly. A bit of all the world titles, I just really want that one. It's like. I don't know. It seems to be the most important one. Yeah, it definitely. Uh, my favorite color is the color of the belt. So it yeah. kind of appeals to me. And uh, uh, so I just wanted to kind of end things just looking at uh, the card coming up June 10th. Um, of course, we just talked about your fight, but we got a returning uh, Tyson Cave. And you better I would show just up. Curious he better show up. Oh, okay, you're on notice there, Tyson. Tyson, he got it. Like he, he, he's, he's constantly like posting that he's gonna fight and then he doesn't fight. He's gonna fight and he doesn't fight. Just show up and fight. The people love you there. He's an entertaining fighter, and yes. what a matchup between him and um, Pedro. Pedro, yes. What a matchup. So I really just just show up and fight, Tyson. Don't don't not fight. He <laughs> might win too, right? So yeah, yeah. You never know. Like, like when I think about Tyson and his style, that southpaw, like, uh, just showman, showman style, counterpuncher style, like he's influenced a lot of the scene down here. I, I felt, um, just 100%. This, yeah, um, you know, a lot. I know I, I've trained with people. I haven't trained with Tyson directly, but I've trained with people that were under his tutelage and everything like that, and you know. His, his style is just uh, very interesting. Very interesting style. And, uh, yeah, I, I hope that, that this fight goes through. Um, when I saw it was for the youth belt, uh, I, I was like, what's what's going on here? But I, I know it just uh, – I think it's I, – I saw him talk in the interview. I think it's up to 26 that you can fight for the, the youth title. So I think it's not on the line with Pedro. But Pedro is the WBC youth champ. Right That's now. right. He's also got a CPBC belt, I believe he won in his okay. last fight. Yeah, but I I don't know anything about 
anything about the titles, but I really hope I really hope Tyson just he's training and he actually takes this serious and fights because you know I got nothing bad to say about him. He's just he's a great great um, a great guy to have still like in boxing in Halifax, especially Halifax. Like he's a big name there, you know, and uh, he's an entertainer. That's the most that's the most important thing about him is he he entertains and the you know like. I just hope he shows up to fight. Yeah. God I damn do. it, Tyson. Get your goddamn road work in and fight this guy. <laughs> yeah, I think he's got a really interesting story going on with, uh, you know, you got Daniel Beaupre coming with him, working with him, getting him into the gym and everything like that. Yeah. What's some, what's some other standouts from this card? Like, like you being, you being the main event and everything, like what's some, what's some fights that you're really looking forward to underneath you? You're gonna have to. You're gonna have to tell me the lineup because I don't. Okay. Know. Okay. You got uh, Arthur. Um, I'm gonna. Oh yes, yeah. The yeah. I know uh, what you're talking Z- about. Ziatinov yep. versus Francisco Ruiz. Yeah, that's a guy that Three Lions has signed recently, I believe. Okay. From uh, Russia. Uh, I don't. I don't know much about him. To be honest with you, don't know much about him, but he looks good. You got Kyle McNeil coming into three lions versus Dylan Rushton. That's a good fight. Yep. That's an interest. That's going to be a firework fight, and that's going to go the distance. Yep. That'll go however many rounds it's scheduled for. Yeah. I'm trying to. See. I think he fought. I think he fought maybe eight last fight. I'm not sure. What the? Let me just check that real quick. So we got Kyle. Let me just see this about. Scheduled for eight at Welter. Yeah, that's that fight is definitely going to go the distance. Um, I don't know who would uh, who would win that fight. That's going to be a close fight. Yeah, um, I know that his his last fight uh, didn't go his way. As far as I think there was a clash of heads, clash of heads that that put put that fight to, st- to a stop. Um, somebody I really like, Brett Beaton's going to be on the card. Uh, yeah, I like Kyle Brett. Miller is his opponent. Yeah, oh, he's Brett. fighting. He's uh, fighting that guy. Yeah, he's fighting that guy. I got Brett by so, knockout. I mean, Brett by knockout. Okay. Yep. Yep. Brett by knockout. So yeah, it's a great card there. Um, just just finishing off. What does it mean? What does it mean to somebody from Cape Breton to be in Halifax? Oh, it's big. Like it's it's a big fight. It's honestly to me, this fight is probably personally it's bigger than my world title fight against Rivas. It's mm-hmm. bigger than the fight, the big fights I've had in Cape Breton. And reason is because the Halifax Forum has held some legendary fights, legendary fighters. Like that's you know when you were from Cape Breton back in the day, like when Tyrone Gardner, Blair Richardson, you know Rocky McDougal, and all these guys were fighting. It was like a main goal of them was to get to the Halifax form to fight the big fights. You know, they would put on the big fights there, like the Canadian titles and stuff. They would have fights at the Glace Bay form, but like going from Cape Breton to Halifax is like you're going into the big city. It's like the Madison Square Garden of Nova Scotia, you know, and just from being from Nova Scotia and and being able to to bring a fight of this magnitude there, like for Halifax and. It's just to me, this is like Madison Square Garden. To be honest with you, I think it'd be bigger just just because it's my home. It's 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 you know it's where I'm from and and like being a part of it and then allowing the and then like it's it's given opportunity to guys like like Brett and Kyle and Tyson to to fight on the undercard and then they're gonna get some big exposure from it too and and hopefully eventually like let's say Brett at one day he'll be headlining the the card. You know, at the forum, because I, I I'm not, you know, I don't need I don't care if I'm the the main event or not. I just want to be there. I just want to be fighting. I just want to fight. I could I could be opening up the card. Don't matter to me. So hopefully maybe the next one, some one of the other guys can headline her. But at least at least I'm I'm starting it for them. You know. For sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. I just want to say, hey, Ryan, it was really really great talking to you. Appreciate you coming on and uh just wanted to wish you good luck with your fight coming up yeah thank you man i appreciate too everything you're doing and uh you know giving all these 
these local fighters a chance to talk and share their stuff, you know? Yeah, appreciate yeah. it. Thank you so much. Have a good day. You too, bro. And I hope you guys enjoyed this episode of the podcast. I really enjoyed having Ryan on. I know that quite a bit of the discussion that we talked about was mostly about stuff that existed outside of boxing or the mentality of the stuff that you don't see. But in regards to his case, I think that's probably one of the most interesting things that you could talk to him about. Um, and we, we really touched a whole lot of great things on this podcast. Um, we talked about Ryan and his story, um, you know, kind of uh, coming back from everything. You know, that's he's a, he's a, comp- he's a throwback fighter. He's, he's a fighter that that really idolizes Jack Dempsey in the old style, the old way of boxing. Um, and he's also somebody that's come back from a lot of things in his life as well as his career. And certainly something that he always does and I can respect and appreciate. And he said to himself, uh, he's not the conventional role model for a lot of people, but what he wants to show people is that from people in, in a bad background or have a history of getting in trouble like he had that there is an outlet and there's a way to do all that stuff in a more uh, ethical sound way if that makes sense uh, so I really appreciated having him on talking and I really look forward to his fight June 10th of course there's gonna be a bunch of fighters um, from Halifax from Dartmouth from the Twin Cities fighting on this card and possibly more interviews coming up with those people who knows uh guys i have a lot of things in store and plan for this summer i've really missed you guys i hope you guys are seeing some improvement uh with my abilities because i really feel like this year of taking the program that i've taken at school it's really helped me uh improve in a lot of different aspects maybe aspects that you can't see in the show but certainly as a journalist and i'm really excited for everything that i have in store so without further ado guys if you're watching this episode for the first time and you're watching it on youtube make sure to subscribe to the channel that way when a new episode comes out you don't miss it you can also like comment as well as share the video it always helps of course if you're listening to the the podcast on your preferred pl- podcasting platform you can subscribe to it there and you can also give a rating to how well you liked the episode whether you liked it or not it always helps uh so without further ado guys i hope whatever time you're listening to this episode you're having a good day and i look forward to bringing you another episode soon so without do- further ado have a good day Yo, the ring general, sweet science, deep like a mineral. You can see the hunger in my interviews. Peep the interlude, this is just a preview. Give you all I got, put the past in the rear view. My team ready, the theme steady. Got bad intentions like I seen petty. Still a good dude, stay humble, never messy. Never crumble under pressure, I'm shining like God bless me.